In 2011, the Church of England announced, with pride and gusto, the 200th anniversary of the creation by the Church of free education for all children in England and Wales. And they announced this event as an act of pure philanthropy, a desire from the Church to give something of itself to the nation. But was it a philanthropic act or self-centred protectionism? A closer analysis of the events of the time tells a very different story. And if we look back at the events which led to the Church of England becoming involved in mainstream education for the masses, a time when the most recent bout of indoctrination began which led to so many of the adults of today being conditioned to support Christianity, we see a very different motive for the involvement of the Church to that which the Church alludes to today. And we also see just how recent the current rebranding of the message of the Church to one of a persona of love, charity and forgiveness actually is. During the 19th century, Britain saw a rapid expansion of the number of Church of England churches throughout England and Wales. And it is important to highlight this because there is no one alive today who witnessed the visual landscape prior to this church expansion programme. Walk into a village today and your eyes will be greeted with a pleasing scene with an idyllic church building at its centre. Couple this visually pleasing scene with religious indoctrination from your school days and you might conclude that the scene you are looking at with the church at its heart is a scene that has existed throughout time from medieval Britain through to today. But such a subconscious view is most likely to be wrong and the scene you are looking at is likely to be less than 200 years old. In many cases prior to 1811 to 1875 the church building you are viewing simply did not exist whilst the village clearly did. And this is one such church. To a layman like myself it has a look and feel which suggests that it is centuries old and steeped in the history of English Christian theology. But in actuality it is merely Victorian, built in a three year period between 1856 to 1859. A mere 154 years ago, this scene did not exist. Why was there so much building and restoration of churches in the 19th century? In an interview with James Betley to the Victorian Albert Museum, some elements pointed out are as follows. We need to consider that in the 19th century there was still a great fear and suspicion of Roman Catholics and a staunchly religious and Protestant parliament and monarchy perceived a sense of competition from the Roman Catholic Church and also from non-conformist Anglicans. The Anglican Church still held three state services during the year in the 1800s. One on the 5th of November, originally an anti-Pope pageant one on the anniversary of the execution of King Charles I and one on the anniversary of the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. These were three very symbolic historical events and the aim of their veneration was intended to illustrate the ties of the Church of England with the monarchy at its head to the state. The Church of England held a sway of theocratic power and Catholics and non-conformist Protestants were not permitted office in the House of Commons until 1828. After 1828 this privilege was also extended to Jews and eventually to atheists. So prior to 1828 the House of Commons was 100% religious 100% Protestant and 100% Church of England. The law of the land guaranteed this regardless of the religious stroke non-religious makeup of the population of the time. Even after the concessions from 1828 onwards the makeup of the house would still have been overwhelmingly Church of England for the remainder of the century. When we hear the phrase constantly vocalised today by the religious faithful that Britain is historically and traditionally a Christian country, 
It really only refers to the minority ruling classes, not the masses. The actual religious views of the masses are not really recorded in any form save the court proceedings which prosecuted religious dissenters. At the start of the 19th century, people's perception of religion was beginning to change as people began to soak up the strong counter-arguments from the Enlightenment of the late 17th and 18th centuries. Enlightenment views were reaching the masses and taking effect. National support for religion was beginning to fade. A situation which, as far as the religiously biased parliament and monarchy of the 19th century were concerned, needed to be addressed with positive counteraction. And this counteraction came to fruition with the restoration of disused and the construction of new Church of England churches on a scale hard to imagine. At the beginning of the 19th century, circa 1811, there were about 10,000 parish churches throughout the country. 925 of these needed restoration, such as this church in Great Amwell, leaving some 9,075 serviceable churches. By 1872, 3,204 new churches had been built and the 925 disused churches had been entirely restored. 4,129 new Church of England churches within a period of 64 years. In addition to this monumental construction stroke restoration program, in 1811 the government allocated the new task of educating the masses to the Church of England. And this gave the Church of England carte blanche to indoctrinate all the children of the working classes of England and Wales and so ensuring an antidote to the views of the Enlightenment and the filling of Church of England pews well into the future. From a survey conducted in 1875, the total cost of building was estimated to be in excess of £24 million, and this would extrapolate out to be in excess of £1 billion in today's terms. James Betley does not state in his interview how this was funded, but the New Churches Act of 1818 allocated £1 million of taxpayers' money to the venture. Further taxpayers' funds presumably followed. In 1807, the Parochial Schools Bill was being debated in Parliament with a motion that the state should offer an education facility to all children in order to help the poor improve their standard of living and so help themselves out of poverty. The bill initially received opposition in two areas. Firstly, there were some pretty vile characters in the House of Commons at the time who argued that educating the poor would be folly, as it would give them the means with which to be unhappy with the station that life had allocated them, and it would therefore be unkind to do this. They postulated that the nation needed the poor to stay uneducated in order that they continue to conduct their manual labours with gratitude, absent such knowledge and ideas which could possibly turn them rebellious. Mr William Davis Giddy, MP for Bodmin, said, For however specious in theory the project might be of giving education to the labouring classes of the poor, it would in effect be found to be prejudicial to their morals and happiness. It would teach them to despise their lot in life instead of making them good servants in agriculture and other laborious employments to which their rank in society had destined them. Instead of teaching them subordination, it would render them factious and refractory. As was evident in the manufacturing counties, it would enable them to read seditious pamphlets, vicious books and publications against Christianity. It would render them insolent to their superiors and... In a few years, the result would be that the legislator would find it necessary to direct the strong arm of power towards them and furnish the executive magistrates with much more vigorous laws than were now in force. This view from the religiously bigoted in high office was not the thoughts of just a few of the staunchly Church of England wealthy classes. 
it was endemic of the time. Consider the verse from the hymn All Things Bright and Beautiful, which has long since been removed from the hymn due to the vile sentiment of the prose. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate, God made them high and lowly, and ordered their estate. This hymn was written by the wife of the Bishop of Derby in 1848, and this particular verse is truly disgusting. Please also note at this stage, for later reference, MP William Davis Giddy's concern over the masses being able to read Publications Against Christianity, if taught how to read. This demonstrates two facts. Such publications existed in 1807 in enough quantity as to cause such concern, possibly as a result of the Enlightenment at the tail end of the 18th century, and it concerned Parliament and the clergy that people were reading them and taking note of them. The second concern over the bill came from MPs with slightly more humane personalities and agendas, who agreed that it should be the duty of the state to offer the chance of education to all of its citizens, but would not support the bill because the cost would be prohibitive to the nation. The Marquis of Titchfield added, I think much benefit might result from general education, but that benefit might cost too dear. The Church of England observed the proceedings from the sidelines with the utmost interest. In 1811, the Church of England created the National Society for Promoting Religious Education, or just National Society as it is now known, with a stated mission of supplying free education to the children of the masses. It portrayed this mission, and still does portray it today, as a purely philanthropic action. But was it? Take particular note of the name, Promoting Religious Education, not Promoting Education. Now, the Church of England could have levelled the scales and offered a free education facility to the masses at any time in its 277-year history prior to 1811. But, prior to 1811, the position of the Church in society was secure and unshakable, largely due to its own readiness to invoke oppressive use of the blasphemy laws. For reference, Percy by Shelley's expulsion from Oxford for the publication of a pamphlet titled The Need for Atheism, and two turns in jail for Robert Taylor for preaching deism from the pulpit. And this fanatical use of the blasphemy law was also prolific in the 277 years prior to 1811, and it ensured that the status of the church in Britain had never been in jeopardy. To illustrate the ferociousness with which the blasphemy laws were enacted in the 1534 to 1811 time frame, Consider the fate of James Naylor in 1656. James was charged with blasphemy for staging a reenactment of the Palm Sunday procession in which he played the role of Jesus. And James was also a thorn in the side of the Church of England for openly protesting against slavery and having a sizeable following of Quakers who saw him as divinely touched. His punishments after conviction of blasphemy were flogging, having the letter B branded into his forehead to represent the word blasphemer, so all who saw him were aware of his crime, and having his tongue bored through with a red-hot iron, to teach him a lesson, I presume. And this was the lesser punishment. He was informed that he was lucky not to have received the death penalty. Now, countless others were not so lucky, and were murdered by the Church of England of the time. The last man to be burned in London for blasphemous heresy was Bartholomew Legge in 1612, and the last man in England burnt for heresy was Edward Whiteman of Burton-on-Trent, also in 1612. William Loud, the future Archbishop of Canterbury, ordered Edward Whiteman to be excommunicated and condemned to be burnt at the stake following approval by King James I. Whiteman's two murderers, therefore, held the office of Archbishop of Canterbury and King of England. And moreover, this 
king of England, considered himself so devout that he gives us, as a nation, the modern English version of the Bible, the King James Bible. After 1612, the act of burning heretics in public ceased, more due to the outrage from the public than for any remorse from the religious authorities for their victims. Rather, after 1612, heretics were tried in private and then quietly imprisoned. However, the punishment of burning for heresy still officially stood until it was abolished in 1677. But the divinely ordained murder of citizens did not stop in 1677. Thomas Aikenhead was a Scottish student from Edinburgh who was prosecuted and executed on a charge of blasphemy at the age of 20 in 1697. He was the last person in Britain to be executed for blasphemy. But then there were also witches and warlocks which needed to be dealt with by the religious authorities of the Church of England. In Exeter, in 1685, Alice Mollen became the last person executed for the pathetic accusation of witchcraft. The last execution for witchcraft in Scotland was in 1722, and that is just four lifetimes ago. However, the inhumane application of Iron Age religious bigotry did not stop in 1722, and many people were still to suffer harsh punishments for blasphemy up to and including 1921, a mere 90 years ago. The last person in Britain to be sent to prison for blasphemy and ordered to serve hard labour was John William Gott. And John did not live long following the last of his many imprisonments for crimes against religion. And we have to consider that 1921 is just over one lifetime ago. So the current persona of love, forgiveness and charity portrayed by the present incumbents of office within the Church of England, is a very recent rebranding of an organisation that was, until 90 years ago, vile, inhumane and thoroughly greedy. Due to the duress with which it forced its station, the Church of England was more than happy to leave education as a luxury for the rich. The mindset of the masses, the poor, was well in line with church dogma and in no way considering a move away from church adherence. But then came the Enlightenment and eminent educated people in society began to question the position of the church in society and, more worryingly for the church, its core message. This was conducted in a considered and industrial manner with the use of publications and pamphlets which were widely circulated and available to anyone with the ability to read, to read, digest and discuss. Indeed, even in a small community of completely illiterate inhabitants, it only took one member of that community, or a traveller to that community, with the ability to read and possession of such a pamphlet, to spread such sedition against the church among the community. The Church of England would not be able to outlaw or stop such meetings and readings and the subsequent communication of Enlightenment ideas. They realised that the staunchly against educating MPs plan of attack, being not to educate the masses, would not in itself be sufficient to combat the spread of damning anti-church literature from reaching the ears of their congregations. We should therefore strongly question and investigate the possibility that the creation of the National Society by the Church and the subsequent Church-controlled education of all children was not a desire from the Church to give something of itself to the nation, but rather a self-centred knee-jerk protective reaction from the Church designed to combat the negative effect which arose from the Enlightenment of the 18th century. And the possible future damage which might result from the then 1811 government debate on the supply of free education to the children of the masses.
particularly when we consider the stated aim of the creation of the National Society at its conception as given by the then church authorities and that stated aim was that the national religion should be made the foundation of national education and the goal it set itself was to found a church school in every parish in England and Wales. Also, we should contrast this message of apparent goodwill, empathy and desire to do good in the world with the then head of the Church of England and incumbent Archbishop of Canterbury, Charles Manners Sutton, and his role as head of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel to Foreign Parts. Which owned hundreds of African slaves, which it put to work in the Church of England's own plantations. And the slaves belonging to the Church of England were easy to identify. They had the word society branded into their backs with red hot irons. When the emancipation of the slaves arrived in 1833, the next Archbishop of Canterbury for the Church of England, William Howley, held out his hand to take £8,823.08 8 from the taxpayer's purse in compensation to the Church of England for the loss of its stock, being the surviving 411 slaves it still owned. So, an organisation which professed the sanctity of human life was quite happy to treat humans as balance sheet assets and place a price on their worth when forced to dispose of such assets. The point being, this organisation and its front of goodwill, empathy and desire to do good in the world was a complete smokescreen and a total sham. The Church of England of 1811 was indeed, as opposed to word, thoroughly ruthless murderous and vile. Countless slaves never made it to emancipation and died at the hands of the Church of England's employees on the plantations. Just as the Church of England branded its name into the backs of its slaves to mark them as Church of England property, so too it wanted to brand its theology into the minds of every child in England and Wales, to claim them as fully indoctrinated members of its cult and future spiritual stock. The hypothesis emerging from these events is some eminent members of society were questioning and shaking the foundation of the church. Education was only available to the rich. There was a desire from the government to educate the masses as a means of combating poverty. The Church of England feared the possibility that the children of the masses would be educated toward the views of the Enlightenment and that this would lead to the ultimate demise of the Church within a generation and demolish their position in society, particularly among the masses. The Church of England in 1811 was extremely wealthy in cash, land and property and held significant political influence. It was therefore in a position to take action to alleviate its own fears. The Church thus stepped forward and offered itself as the conduit with which to deliver the government's desired education of the masses. Their ulterior motive was if they controlled the education of the children of the masses as far as secular subjects were concerned, they could manage, counter and temper access to the knowledge being put forward by those of the Enlightenment. And they could supplement this program by subjecting the children to lessons of religious instruction and at the same time subject the children to daily acts of Christian worship. In short, the church used their wealth and influence to hijack the mass education program which was already on the cards and in doing so used it to censor the effects of the Enlightenment, indoctrinate children on a mass scale on a daily basis and thereby ensure a constant flow of religious adherence into the future and ultimately its own survival.
We now also recall from the start of this communication the nationwide church building program which ran at exactly the same time in our history. New schools to indoctrinate future congregations in and new church pews for them to sit in. In their efforts to combat the effects of the Enlightenment, the Church of England used the ill-gotten wealth they had gained from their plantations and slave ownership, along with taxpayers' money, to flood the country with new church buildings and sought to take full control of children's education. So, the creation of the National Society for Promoting Religious Education was not a philanthropic act at all but rather completely arrogant and selfish in motive, and it still is today. The aims of the National Society are still the national religion should be made the foundation of national education. And to achieve this, the National Society, the Church of England, desires to found a church school in every parish in England and Wales. This is the Church of England's true rationale for religious education, the indoctrination of children. And it is the camouflaged reason which is never put forward by the Church of England in media debates today. Why? Because it sounds, when being voiced, to be exactly what it is, a desire from the Church of England to indoctrinate. Rather, the Church of England will always use alternative arguments such as it is important to teach children about religion in order to teach them to respect people of faith and to teach them general good morals or some such equivalent argument. However, given that today's literal version of a historic Jesus is demonstrably fictitious plagiarism of ancient allegorical versions of a mythical Christ, Literalist Christianity was forced onto the population of the Roman Empire upon pain of death and torture, and the Church of England still used oppression to force its views onto the population up to and including 1921, it is now time for our government to admit that the Church should never have been allowed to take control of the education programme in the first instance, that it should have been tax-funded and secular from the start. It is now 2013 and it is high time we ended church involvement in the education of children, matters of state and the taxpayers purse.